uh, it would be super interesting as well, especially because Sam's gotten both that web to large organizations and web free experience. So not uh, super common in our space that people can can bridge both worlds. And that makes it even more interesting for what we're trying to do with Arandao and these talks that is try to understand the fundamental principles that allows that will allow us to move organizations forward irrespective of whether they're starting in a more, in a more traditional way or starting in a more web free or digital native way so uh with that sam over to you thank you for being with us cool thank you very much it's uh, a pleasure to be here um real quick administrative thing up front my mic has been cutting out all day with my clients so if i suddenly disappear someone please do something with their hands to get my attention uh because i will i will just keep talking uh that that is for sure gonna happen uh i'm gonna share my screen here uh, so we can get a few slides up and what i have prepared here today hopefully is like maybe 30 ish minutes or so maybe a little bit longer if i'm being honest with myself of uh, some some thoughts about um, the work that I do at the ready and what I had been doing um, in uh, the DAO world over the course of 2021 and 2022. And I hope it's just enough to kind of spur a uh, interesting conversation um, that we can have together. So my intention is not to spend the whole time talking um, as much as I like the sound of my own voice. I'm just cleaning up my desktop here so that I am fully dialed in. Okay, can you all see this slide that says who is the ready? Okay, very good. So um, we started uh, in 2015. Um, I, I joined as the first employee back then um, as a an org transformation org design uh, consultancy. Uh, basically, we uh, were fascinated with um, some newer or some different ways of thinking about organizations. So things like holacracy, sociocracy, self-managed uh, organizations, and we're curious to bring more of that sort of thinking uh, to organizations that were decidedly not self-managing. So often very large uh, bureaucratic organizations. And the basic insight um, that our founder had with his previous uh, strategy consultancy is that time and time again, they would do really great strategic work, really smart work that they were excited about that the client was excited about, but there would they had there was no ability for clients to actually metabolize these new ideas into something that was actually showing up in the world. And that became our fascination. That's the more interesting question. What is it about how organizations run that makes it so it's impossible for them to get out of their own way? Um, so that is what we were founded on. And since since 2015, we've been doing lots of different types of, of work. The Ready itself is a self-managing uh, organization. And in the fall of 2021, after I came back from a sabbatical through most of 2022, I spent most of my time um, kind of exploring the world of, of DAOs. So I was new to the scene in, in 2021 and you know through 2022, spending a lot of time um, in that world. Uh, getting involved as an advisor in a couple of different DAOs, uh, doing some work uh, with Gitcoin, uh, which I'll talk, uh, I can talk a little bit more about. But really, the fundamental thing that I was charged with by my colleagues was figure out what's going on here, because as a self-managed self organization, something called decentralized autonomous organizations is fascinating. Like we should be, we should be in this and no, really knowing what's what's going on. So show up, participate in the world, figure out if we have anything to offer to these organizations and uh, reciprocally what can we learn uh, as well so i think uh, a lot of good happened in both directions and the structure of this talk is i'm going to spend a few minutes up front kind of just talking about the um, kind of theory and concepts that we bring to our work with all organizations and then i will bring it back to focus more on my experience uh, with with DAOs. So I think to many people, organizations can feel like black boxes. Ignore the fact that this one is brown. Um, that's just the attention of detail that I was that I was bringing uh, to to preparing these slides today. It's hard to know what's going on in a lot of our traditional organizations. 
Um, or they can feel like immutable forces of nature. If you've ever worked in a huge bureaucracy, it can feel like it is something that has existed forever and will continue to exist forever. And it is it cannot be affected by human effort. It is somehow like otherworldly in that regard. Uh, or um, uh, organizations can feel like straight up chaos uh, sometimes. And that's true for some of our traditional clients, but I think in the, the DAO world, um, sometimes this was the predominant feeling that I was getting from the DAOs that I was contributing to or trying to uh, work with is that there was just so much in flux all the time. It was really hard to tell what was, was going on. And if you can think about organizations living on a continuum with pure bureaucracy on one end of the continuum and straight up chaos on the other end of, our, of the contri contri continuum, most of the Redis work is kind of with organizations and closer to the bureaucracy end. And I think uh, the work we were doing with DAOs, which partially what's made it so fascinating for me, was more so on um, the other end. There's nuances here, which we'll talk about, because I think straight up chaos can kind of create its own flavor of bureaucracy, which we'll, uh, which we'll get into. So when I talk to people about the work that the Ready does and the um, kind of way we see organizations, ultimately what I'm trying to do is give you a, a new lens through which you see the organizations you interact with. Uh, because when you can perceive what is going on in an organization in a new way, it means that you can unlock new ways to build and, and change them. And that's what's really exciting to me. Like that's what that's why I get up every day to do this work is that I think our organizations, whether they are DAOs or IBM, you know, need need to be vehicles for progress. They need they're they're there are human superpower. You know, the, the problems that are in front of us in the world are going to be solved by organizations, not by well-meaning individuals. So we need our organizations to to work. Uh, frankly, is, is the simplest way that I can that I can describe it. Um, another way is that, you know, I think getting some org design echolocation allows you to uh, see your your surroundings in a new way and interact with them uh, in a new way. So I've uh, talked to a bunch of people who have been introduced to this work, and this is one of the metaphors that they that they use. They, they said that when they started. Um, seeing organizations in this new way, it felt like they had, they kind of gained echolocation that they could now see things um, just fundamentally differently that they couldn't before. So I thought that was a fun metaphor and a good excuse to put a picture of a bat in a slide deck. So let's start with these two words, which in everyday kind of English use are almost synonyms. Uh, we will kind of interchange these words and use them in the same sort of uh, situation. So something is complicated, something is complex, kind of means the same thing. But in uh, systems theory, these are very different. They describe different types of systems, and they are fundamental to understanding what is going on in organizations, whether DAOs or uh, bureaucratic organizations. And in, I guess I, for the rest of this talk, anytime I say organization, you can replace that with, with DAO uh, as well, because I think everything that I say here is, uh, is relevant. So uh, kind of a quasi pop quiz. Uh, what we have here are just, uh, images of two different types of systems. So a watch mechanism on the left, an engine on the right. And uh, my question for you is, are these complicated systems or are they complex systems? If you wanna throw an answer in the chat, we can actually do this as a little uh, pop quiz. So are these complicated or complex? Got some complicated, complex. Okay, cool. There's always a mix. Nice. So let's look at another one. So here, these filters made these images hard to see. Poor slide design on my part. But we have weather, we have traffic on the right, uh, and these are examples of either complicated or complex. So I'm gonna use kind of the opposite. The people who voted for whatever you did on the previous slide, I'm gonna take the opposite. And the, the result here is actually the engine and the watch are examples of complicated uh, systems. 
And the uh, weather and the traffic are examples of complex adaptive systems. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more uh, about that. I gotta hide the chat though, cause I'm gonna get distracted. All right, so engines, watches, they are incredibly intricate and they do require a lot of expertise. So just because they aren't complex doesn't mean that just anybody can understand them. You need training to know what is going on. However, if you are a master watchsmith or a master mechanic and I bring you my broken engine, you can analyze it and you can see what is broken. You can know how to fix it and actually make that, that repair. You can bring that system back to a state of working fully functionally. It requires expertise, you have to be trained, but you can do it. So you sense, you analyze, you respond. That's the nature of the system and that relationship between cause and effect uh, is quite clear. This thing is broken, which is causing this effect in the system. I will fix this thing and that effect will go away. Complex systems are uh, fundamentally different. Um, if you just think about you know, something like the weather uh, or traffic, you are not able to predict it to the same level of certainty that you can a broken engine. You can certainly gather a ton of data and make predictions. You can uh, simulate the system and run it through different scenarios and see how it would respond to conditions around it changing. But it's fundamentally, you know, you can't tell me tomorrow in this, you know, 10 by 10 square foot uh, patch of ground, it is gonna rain precisely this amount because of these reasons and, and like you could with a, a broken engine. So in these sorts of systems, the relationship between cause and effect is much more tenuous to perceive. It's harder to perceive and really in many cases kind of only perceived in, in hindsight. So if you want to understand this sort of system, you can't just sit back and gather data and try to look at it and figure out what it's going to do you actually interact with it and see how it responds to you you then can respond to that response and you're in kind of this dialogue with the system to see how it is changing to the things that you are doing uh, to it which is a fundamentally different thing um, than, than complicated and the reason i'm belaboring this is because it really matters how we are perceiving organizations if we are bringing a uh, complicated, oh gosh, there we go. A, if we are perceiving our organizations as complicated mechanisms like engines or like watches, then we are gonna have a very challenging time because they are absolutely complex systems. One human being alone is a complex system, bringing together tens to hundreds to tens of thousands of people together to work on things together you're dealing with something that is much more like the weather than it is a broken watch. And yet most organizations are running operating systems that were really initially founded in the industrial era. The industrial era for lots of reasons, including the fact that you know, the, the nature of the work that was being done in kind of assembly lines that you don't have the internet and all of the disruption that that causes with instantaneous communication around the world, simpler supply chains, you could get away with and actually thrive thinking about the organization as a mechanical uh, sort of uh, complicated system, swapping people out interchangeably with minimal training. It was like an engine more than it was the, a garden or the weather. However, as the world has moved forward to where we are today, we can't operate with that same sort of assumption about how organizations actually work, especially if your organization is not making widgets, but is doing some sort of creative work where fundamentally you are coming together to put something that the world has never seen into existence. That requires the uh, creativity and the unexpected and the kind of just amorphous, ambiguous nature of trying to do creative work. We're much more in, in complexity. So, to help us start to do something with that distinction, we use the metaphor, the analogy of an operating system within organizations. So these are the largely unseen foundational beliefs, assumptions, principles, and practices that shape our ways of working. So the operating system is the soil, the quality of the soil will create what we actually see in the plan. And what we see in our organizations is what it feels like to be a part of that organization, the impact that it's having in the world, the soil, the operating system is, is, the, um, is where all of that comes from. And if we want to try to improve our organizations, 
then we are better off kind of working at the operating system level than we are simply trying to prune or optimize the things that we can see, the stuff that is above the ground uh, on, on the plant. So let's talk about how operating systems show up. This is a non-organizational example, but I think it will give us some really good insights as to um, kind of how this shows up in organizations as well. So on the left and on the right, we have the exact same uh, situation that we have to navigate, which is two roads coming together in an, uh, in an intersection. And we need a way to safely make sure that traffic can go through this intersection. So on the left, we have a, a system with some certain beliefs and assumptions and principles. And on the right, we have uh, some assumptions about the people and the problem uh, as well. So on the left, we have a series of assumptions that really, you know, one of them is that people need to be told to go or not go. Um, basically, don't kind of look at your surroundings and make judgment, but look at the uh, the lights and the lights will tell you when it is safe to go. And for most of us, especially in the United States where, where traffic signals are much more common than uh, roundabouts on the right, this is just the unquestioned default for all, uh, all intersections that will show up, will follow the red lights that we all trust, that we all understand what the lights mean, uh, and it works pretty well. On the right hand side, we have a series of uh, assumptions that are really more about people needing to figure it out. So when you are approaching a roundabout, you cannot turn your brain off. You have to see what is happening in the roundabout so you know how to react, whether you need to yield to, to somebody or figure out if someone is going doing it wrong. Like you can't just sit there at, like you can at a red light and just kind of zone out for a bit. You have to be in dialogue, in interaction with the system to safely navigate it. There are other assumptions baked in here uh, as well. Interesting ones about that will always have access to electricity, that the experts who who scheduled or, or programmed the traffic lights did a good job, that if I have a green light, I can trust that there's not a green light going in the other direction. There's a certain elegance and simplicity to the roundabout, you know, working in a power outage, things of, of that nature. But really, we don't care about simplicity or elegance with something like this. There are objective measures that we care about for our intersections. And uh, by most measures i'll come back to this one by most measures roundabouts actually are a better option so things that we would care about for an intersection fatal collisions down by 90 percent makes sense if you think about it if there is going to be a collision it's probably going to be lower speed and kind of glancing and not t-boning each other at 50 miles an hour 89 percent reduction in delay so the throughput in most situations is actually higher than a traffic light anybody who sat at a red light at two in the morning when you are the only car within miles around will know kind of that feeling of, of that one for sure generally cheaper to to maintain works normally during outages there's a lot to um there's a lot of great things about roundabouts and then as i said before in the you know, u.s we don't have very many of them. I mean, there are certain regions in the US where there are, are more and they're becoming more and more every day. I was actually just home to Southeast Michigan over the holidays and I couldn't believe how many new roundabouts had been put in since the last time I had been home. But in general, we're kind of dealing with the default of traffic lights. So we on the left, operating system wise, we could talk about this being an operating system of control and compliance. And on the right, it broadly described as an operating system of trust and autonomy. So the takeaway is not let's replace every traffic light with a roundabout. Go to Manhattan and see how well that would work. There are lots of situations where traffic lights are obviously going to be the better choice, but it should get us thinking about, well, what is it about our discomfort with the unknown and changing things that makes the option that is objectively often quite better, not more common than it is. And then when we bring it to our organization, we should be thinking about, well, where are we defaulting within our ways of working to control and compliance just because that's how we always do things when we could potentially be defaulting to trust and autonomy? And again, within our organization, the takeaway is not, well, we throw all the rules out, we throw all the control out, all the compliance out, and we purely work in a realm of trust and autonomy. No, 
but there's probably some nuanced exploration and conversation to be had within our organizations, including within DAOs, about what sort of operating system are we working with here and, and what do we want to be doing. When we look at organizations that are um, kind of outperforming their peers and really meeting this moment well, um, we, we group the things that they are doing within their operating system into two buckets broad very broad buckets so on the left the idea of people positivity it's this it's the the um grouping of practices and principles that are all about the fact that we truly believe that people are naturally motivated and capable of self-direction and worthy of trust and respect not to mean that people don't try to game the system or won't take advantage of you in certain situations it's not that everybody is good all the time but in general the best organizations are operating through a people positivity lens and then on the right hand side complexity consciousness the idea that we really believe that our organizations are complex systems that can't be predicted or controlled. So we don't do a whole lot around trying to predict and tightly control exactly how things go. You know, we do try to change those organizations, but maybe we aren't trying to do a change management process where a group of consultants or the senior leadership kind of go off into a back room and plan out this intricate thing and then cascade it down to the organization because we know we, we know there's no way to predict how exactly that's going to be received by the organization and we're better off doing small things iteratively and experimenting and responding to what's actually happening in the moment. So we use this OS canvas to help bring um, some spe some specificity to the aspects of the operating system. So these 12 different fields are just areas where there are decisions to be made about principles and practices within our organizations. And you could use the OS Canvas to kind of map out the most um, progressive, interesting, self-managing sort of organization. And you could use it to map out what is going on in the most oppressive and bureaucratic uh, organization. It's just a landscape, a canvas for making sense of what's going on. So it includes things from purpose, you know, how we orient and steer, to meetings, you know, how we convene and coordinate, what do we actually believe about meetings in this organization, membership, which I think is super relevant uh, to, to DAOs, and I'll talk more about that, structure, you see, there's lots here. And when we get to the dialogue, um, if I ever stop talking, we can dive deeper into any or all of these. So as I mentioned before, you can think about um, a continuum of, of chaos on one end, bureaucracy on the other end. And it's not about uh, kind of swinging back and forth between these two. The ready, uh, the work we do at the ready is all about finding this third way between them. So we're not trying to create roundabouts everywhere, but we are asking where should we have more roundabouts and have, are we okay with the traffic lights that we have within our organization? So if chaos is no constraints and bureaucracy is purely governing constraints, what is that third way filled with enabling constraints? What does that look like? The, the constraints that actually allow creativity, that allow people to trust and relax a little bit that they understand the system that they are in so that they can bring the, their best selves their most creativity to the actual work at hand and not trying to make sense of what is happening around them organizationally so i had three i think i have three kind of dao specific observations or provocations that i'll, I'll share here um, and then we can we can chat uh, about it so the first one i think kind of hits the fields of strategy workflow, meetings, information, and structure. And it's this thing that I've already been saying a little bit, but I think I entered my un, when I didn't know anything about DAOs and I showed up to my first um, kind of DAO meeting, I think I was maybe assuming that you know, without any sort of traditional bureaucracy, maybe like we're talking about the platonic ideal of the organization here. Like how is it possible for a DAO to have any sort of bureaucracy this must be great. And I think the takeaway was, you know, the absence of traditional bureaucracy is not the platonic ideal of the organization. There are some great things about uh, the fact that most DAOs don't have this really long legacy of organizational debt that they have accrued over the course of their 150 plus year uh, existence. 
haven't been around that long, it's hard to build up organizational debt. But I think I was surprised how quickly organizational debt can accrue, that we start to, that, that policies or processes that were created in one moment just become kind of the status quo in terms of how we do things uh, now. So chaos begets its own flavor of bureaucracy, which I'll walk through here in a second. I've said before, structure actually allows for creativity. It allows people to kind of trust that they understand um, where they are in a system so that they can focus on the work of that system instead of trying to like navigate this really amorphous um, kind of social group. And then knowing how to play frees people up to work toward the purpose of the org and, and not on trying to understand uh, the rules. You know, think about if you've ever played any moderately confusing or moderately intricate board game the first time you play that board game kind of sucks because you're always looking at the rule book you're trying to figure out hey can i do this move can i not do this move like what are we actually trying to do here once you've internalized the rules and internalized the structure of the game then you can actually play the game and it's actually fun and there are very few i can't think of really any games that have no structure to them so I think that sometimes I would get in conversations with folks within DAOs who are very allergic to the idea of any sort of structure. I think there has been a major movement away from that, from what I uh, can tell. And, uh, you know, I get it. There are a lot of people who are contributing to DAOs who their day job is spent within these bureaucratic monsters who may be clients of the ready al already. So I totally get that instinct, but I think there's a lot of nuance to how we think about the role of structure and clarity and process within our uh, organizations, even our most progressive organizations. So real quick, I just wanted to give you this thing about the org debt cycle here. So when we talk, when we say org debt, we talk about what we mean is the um, accrual of process and policy that builds up over time and never really gets removed. It may be made, made sense in the moment when that policy was created. Somebody messed up, we lost a bunch of money, we've created a new rule about how to make sure that never happens. And that gets added to the stack of rules from before and before and before. Next thing you know, you've kind of built this sedimentary rock of bureaucracy within your organization. And the way this org debt um, can build up can flip flop between bureaucracy and chaos, which I think is the interesting one for uh, a, a DAO. So if you think about people, leaders, anyone within an organization having unmet needs of autonomy, connection, and safety, which are pretty fundamental to the human experience, you can respond to that unmet need by introducing more command and control, trying to get your arms more around what is happening here. I gotta tell people what to do. People need to tell me what is going on so that I can control this organization to meet this unmet need of connection potentially i'm feeling disconnected from what's happening let's create a new meeting where my uh my reports come and tell me what is happening this results and can result in much more of a permission culture if you have people around you who are introducing a bunch of command and control well then you start to wait for permission to do things and then as you more and more people are waiting for permission or clarity to do anything that leaves teams feeling very apathetic and stuck. I can't do anything because I'm waiting for my leader or waiting for this team to like do a thing, make a decision. So I'm not going to do anything, which leads to more unmet needs, which can just create more need for command and control. And you've created this like locked in bureaucracy through this unmet need, kind of responding to it in a poor way. However, you can do the opposite as well, which is also not great. You can have unmet needs that you meet with avoidance. So instead of making a decision, instead of introducing some clarity to an unmet need, we're just going to avoid it as well. And we'll just say, hey, we'll figure it out. The team will figure it out. Like, I don't need to make a decision here as a leader, or as somebody who has a stake in what we're trying to do. This creates more of an influence culture. So I know, you know, Sam's never going to make a decision. I just need to kind of be nearby. I need to influence him outside of meetings and kind of eventually, eventually something will kind of happen. And, as, and whoever's closest to the leader, they can make things happen. There's just no clarity. So it really, we revert to personal relationships to get anything done, which is not particularly efficient. So this team, the teams now are left pretty feeling inefficient. They're feeling very dependent, which just creates more unmet needs. And a lot of organizations basically just flip flop between these two different ways, building up more org debt uh, along the way. 
And I think a lot of the interesting, the most interesting thing is, and I need to create a visual for this, but basically how do you split the difference between these two? How can you meet uh, these unmet needs in an organization as someone with influence without getting into the chaos cycle, without getting into the bureaucracy cycle and actually create something a, a little bit more productive? Number two, this is really much more about purpose with, but with some light flavors and strategy and membership as well. I think the simplest way to say it is, you know, clarity of purpose is a powerful magnet at the organizational level. Like, what are we here to do? And implicit or maybe explicit in that is what are we here to not do? What are we not going to do as an organization? That's a great magnet. And usually when people think about magnets, they think about, well, attraction. Who are we going to attract? And if you're really clear about your purpose, then you are have created a magnet that's going to attract the energy and the attention that you want. And the flip side of a magnet as well, you will also repel people who don't want to participate in that in that purpose, people who don't want to contribute to that. And I think that is even more important for DAOs. We're often, not always, but we're often the kind of the line between in and out, between membership in the DAO, not membership in the DAO is quite, can be quite porous. What is attracting people to contributing to your cause. Um, ideally, it's the, the purpose that you are here to actually do and people are drawn to wanting to contribute to that. And it's not something else that is less um, powerful or, or more that can create more questionable incentives, I guess, for how they show up uh, within the DAO. If I am stoked for what the DAO is trying to do, I believe in their purpose. I want that purpose to be out in the world. I'm going to bring like my authentic self, my my creativity, my energy, my intrinsic motivation to make that happen. And if I'm I'm just kind of contributing to a DAO because I think there's an easy buck to be made somehow or other weird uh, dynamics about what's going on there. I don't know. I think that's where you start to get a lot of the churn about how people are showing up if they're actually doing things, if they're not doing things, everything uh, around that. Um, and the work with with Gitcoin was somewhat in this realm, although it was more more strategy uh, focused about getting really clear. Like, what is the essential intent of what we are trying to do? That the those the handful of decisions that if we can make them, it takes care of the a thousand decisions um, outside of of that. And the work of of working through that as a strategy team, as a group of people who are kind of tasked by the DAO to help give strategic clarity. Um, that's where we spent uh, a lot of time. And then the last one uh, that I'll talk about is a little bit about around authority and resources. And uh, Andrea, I, I think you said something about decision research and stuff. And I immediately thought of, of this, which is, um, you know, the toolbox for making decisions within your organization needs to be as varied as, at least as varied as the types of decisions you face. And maybe, you know, I haven't been as connected to the DAO world over the last year or so. For, so perhaps, so I, I think lots have moved beyond this. So there's less of a um, kind of one size fits all option of how we make decisions as an organization. A tactical decision about what to do is very different from a strategic decision about what we're gonna do. And when we talk about kind of the platonic ideal of how organizations make decisions, the vast majority of decisions that are made on a day-to-day -day basis should hopefully be, be, be made locally by roles that have clear authority to make that decision. We don't want somebody on the edge of the organization who has very clear decision rights to feel like they have to run everything up through some sort of hierarchy to get confirmation that they can make the decision. Because by the time that whole process has happened, the reality has changed and it's just a really disempowering way to work. So how many decisions can we push to the edges and feel good that the roles who have that authority have the mastery, have the experience, have the information that they need to make those decisions? A smaller subset of the of decisions are more complex and we still think they should be made by roles, but with a codified advice process. So, hey, Sam, you still ultimately in your role have this decision but you have to follow this advice process where you have to go talk to role A and role B and role C and get their advice because it really influences them as well. And then once you've gotten that advice, we trust you to make that decision. And advice processes can look you know, a little bit different depending on, um, depending on how stringent that uh, advice um, is expected to be followed or, or is it truly just advice? And then lastly, do we have a kind of 
decision making algorithm uh, for for these most complex decisions. We like consent based decision making processes. Um, you know, taking a lot of inspiration from sociocracy with integrative decision making, where instead of getting to consensus where we all agree this is the best path forward, we all agree instead that it's safe. It's safe to try. And my for me to feel like something is safe to try, I don't have to feel like it's the best thing ever. I can actually quite, I can disagree that we should be doing this, but I can't articulate why it's not safe. We'd rather try to get to that consent-based level for a lot of decisions and actually go live with that decision in the world, get data about how things are actually going, rather than arguing about a decision without ever actually making the decision. So I think there's a lot of opportunity um, for growth in all organizations, but also DAOs around how do we make decisions and what do, what do we believe about who can make what sort of decisions and actually getting quite clear about that um, and writing it down and being being explicit and not just letting the decision making landscape live in this implicit space where where nobody's quite sure how things are, are how decisions are made. So generally, we kind of default to not making a whole lot of them. Yeah. Um, so last um, thought here. Sam, sorry, yeah, sorry, if I can yeah. chip in there for a second, just with a clarifying question that was made sure. about what kind of authority are you referring to? Legitimacy, or else in what is it legitimacy? What is the source, positional, formal? If you could share a little bit more about that. Yeah, for sure. So when we're talking about kind of decisions li living locally with clear authority with roles, that word role is very specifically um, used there. So it's not that it's a specific person. Um, it's a role that we have articulated that has qualifications for whoever is holding it um, and you know, assume that people meet those qualifications. We have uh, given that role certain decision rights because we, that role has a purpose in our system. And in order for it to meet its purpose, it needs to be able to make certain decisions. So it's certainly not, we're not talking about like positional authority, positional legitimacy or any sort of like formal legitimacy. It's much more about role-based and ideally that's about competence that's about the work that actually needs to get done um, is what I'm talking about there. Cool. I'll we can come back to that if there's more to, to be had. And if there's stuff happening in the chat, thanks for speaking it up because I don't I don't have the chat open at the moment. So ultimately conceptualize change within organizations. And I think it's relevant to change within DAOs as well. And it's just a simple learning loop. So starting with tension, and I don't mean interpersonal tension. I mean, where in your OS are we experiencing tension? Maybe it's in the authority realm and, and because we're in, for lots of different reasons. There's lots of ways the tension, the tension can show up. Um, but getting good at sensing what that tension is considering a wide array of practices that may help with that tension, inspiration from other places, things we just think up. There's lots of places where really progressive practices are being experimented with. And then actually applying that practice to our context in the form of an experiment. Let's actually try this thing and see how it works for us. We know we're in complexity, so we got to interact with the system to see how the system responds to us. Inevitably, that creates new tension, which is great because then that gives us something else to, to work on. And we try to have this, this continuous participatory change loop happening everywhere in an, an organization. And in a highly bureaucratic organization, when you start to get this learning loop happening up at the very top of an organization and also at the very edges of the organization, you start to get this evolutionary change that's really hard to predict, but uh, can be extremely powerful. And a, a metaphor that I've just kind of landed on in the past couple of days is really we're talking about an ability for an organization to see itself, the metacognitive. So metacognitive, met metacognition, basically thinking about thinking. Well, for an organization, this practice is about seeing how the organization itself is actually working and then making decisions about doing things differently. This is my last thought for us. Um, so most orgs have inherited their, uh, their, their OS through accidents of, of history. You know, they were, they, because of whatever, you know, organization gets starts, people not necessarily thinking about it, like you've inherited the OS that you have and you can certainly change it. But most of our legacy clients have inherited OSs. What would you do if that wasn't true? And that's the case, I think, for the vast majority of, of DAOs, kind of working with an OS canvas that is 
almost truly blank. And I think sometimes that's overwhelming. And um, the more optimistic take on it is that you get to make decisions about everything that is in your OS. And it doesn't mean that you always make the right decision, but it's an opportunity to start with people positivity and complexity consciousness from day one, instead of trying to import it into an organization where those sorts of ideas are quite uh, foreign. That's it. A little bit longer than half an hour, um, but I'd be very curious for questions and reactions and just feedback in, in general. Thank you. All right, I'll open the chat now as well. Yeah. Great, thank you uh, very much for that presentation. I I was already seeing a series of questions and uh, yeah, for everyone who would like to ask, you can use in the reactions, raise your hand and I'll pass it over to you. Uh, Andrea, I'm thinking specifically about you as well. Please raise your hand, I'd love to hear your question. But uh, Val, over to you. Awesome, hi, thank you. Um, I love Brave New Work. So um, this is so cool to see a presentation from you guys. Um, I'm really wondering how you're thinking about and what you saw in DAOs and what you see in organizations altogether about incentives and compensation to achieve yeah. trust and autonomy. Like we talk about incentives kind of all the time, but I'm wondering how, how you're looking at incentives to be able to achieve trust and autonomy. And have you seen that? Have you seen incentives make yeah. a difference or does that motivation to, you know, be, uh, you know, trustful or, 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 and have autonomy, does that motivation come from somewhere else? Yeah. Uh, there's so much there. It's such a good question. And I feel like I could do an hour just on this. A couple of thoughts. I almost had one of my three things be something about compensation because, you know, I, I will not purport myself as any sort of DAO expert. In fact, I use my kind of outsider, uh, a role to try to ask really stupid questions all the time. And one of the things that just broke my brain from the beginning was, this is the situation where where contributors were being compensated in the token that also gave them decision rights within the organization and if you spent that that token to live your life you lose decision right your, your authority in the organization goes down and that just like it, that broke my brain so the answer is not that and i i think you know that is not an obvious uh, that that is a kind of an obvious thing you know, at the ready, we experimented a lot with um, getting really granular around compensation. So we started doing a lot of stuff with bounties. Um, you know, hey, there's a piece of work that needs to get done. Let's spin up a bounty, put a put a monetary um, number on it. Someone go and do it, and that worked okay. But there's something about over financializing every sort of action within an organization um, that can get kind of grading over time like it can it, i think uh, there's like some pro-social stuff that you would hope exists within a a strong organization where like i'll do a thing because i want to help you out or i want to like do something to to contribute to the organization and not because i'm getting an extra a hundred dollars this month um that like created some weird dynamics for us granted we are very much not a DAO in the sense that you know, you have to be interviewed and hired, like it's hard to become a member of the ready. So there's already a higher level of trust there. But that's where my um, head head goes to, I guess, lastly, there's like a minimum, there's like a, a hygiene level of compensation that needs to be present in an organization. Um, I think for any sort of like trust stuff to to really be um, to, to grow and to, to happen, you know, if people are below kind of this, this hygiene level of, of compensation, meaning like, you know, they can't, no matter, no matter what, like they are always kind of thinking about being undercompensated. That takes up a lot of cognitive load that I think is um, better than we would like it to be used in other places. I don't know. That was a verbal vomit. There's so much there. I would love to like hear from others on that, but I know there are other questions as well. So it, initial thought. Yeah, that, that, that very much resonates when you're talking about the, that dichotomy of Keeping the keeping the tokens to have governance power or losing them to pay for your life. Uh, while there is something to be said of the the incentive alignment of being financially having skin in the game into the DAO, uh, but one thing we've been looking at, and he's not here today, but we have now one fellow looking into reputation uh, as a way to combine and have a, an alternative metric 
so that at least that aspect is mitigated. You still might lose a little bit of power because you're no longer an investor, but you still have loads of power because you have high context, which is really, yeah. really valuable. Yeah. Uh, and, and I love what you're saying about bounties is something that also resonates a lot with or experience that it can be very tricky and take just so much time at the end of the day to identify these things, right? Um, but let's move it on to Drea, if you'd like to pass on to the next question. Happy to. Um, so I love the theory, um, Sam, you're really speaking to, to a lot of my beliefs, but I'm also very sensitive to the fact that this stuff is hard. Actually doing yeah. it well is hard. Um, so let me think in the context of the decision making and that good sort of structure that you had about mm -hmm. the types of decisions. And I'm curious, what characteristics of organizations have you seen that make them good at adjusting that? You know, good at noticing, oh, wait, this is a complex decision or this. And so one, good at noticing when it's a, a, a thing that needs to be done. And two, being good at doing that advice process. Yeah, 100% agree. Um, I think I, so... The organizations being able to pause long enough to even notice that we should talk about this. So, so much of our work initially is trying to like introduce pauses into how into the work in the form of retrospectives or other structured moments where we can stop being in the work and look at the system that we are working within. Um, so an organization that already has built a little bit of a muscle around like, yeah, hey, you know, every month, every month and a half, we're going to set aside 90 minutes to look at how the last month went and look at it and, and make changes based on that. That's where a lot of that um, kind of talking about how we make decisions can happen. In most organizations, we are just kind of like sprinting from one quasi emergency to another the idea that we could pause long enough to actually create a system where we don't have this this urgency um it just it feels like a luxury that is impossible uh to to have and then i think the other thing is having a kind of a base level of psychological safety um where we can have conversations about like wow like that decision really didn't work out and it doesn't mean that i'm attacking you for having made that decision it's actually an opportunity for us to kind of be sitting shoulder to shoulder and look at the process or the system that led us to think that was the right decision and what we might want to do different about that. There are plenty of cultures that are so toxic, even having that conversation is going to be too much. And there's some kind of basic work to be done before we can do that. Super interesting. Uh, thank you, Hakim, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sam. Great presentation. Um, love the operating system canvas model. We've been using it actually at Haifa DAO. Um, oh, I'm cool. a co-founder and we've, we've been um, building the Haifa DAO platform using a DAO, right? So we've been living this for five years now and yeah. making all of the decisions inside the organization and had no managers around, right? It was great. Yeah. I mean, this is really a tremendous paradigm shift. My, my question for you is um, how... My, my role is really in, in adoption, right? Adoption models for DAOs. How do we bring these things mainstream, right? I mean, they are still very much in the minority, maybe what, 20,000 DAOs out there, right? Um, yeah. And they're catered mostly towards, you know, crypto spaces, right? It's large infrastructure DAOs, you know, it's a blockchain communities who need to make these project decisions, right? But we're not at mainstream yet, right? I think yeah. we're going closer towards that. Um, and uh, I've run some analysis, you know, where we are, because a lot of things have happened, right? There's DAO LLCs now available in the US, you know, there is um, other ways, there's, there's crypto uh, legislation happening in Europe now, which is very beneficial for us. So the, the things are pointing into the right direction, yet we're still struggling to find the right use cases and the right blueprints really to say, this is it, you know, this is where every organization would, you know, strive, would really jump into into the DAO space and use that instead yeah. of traditional organizational forms, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, this points to a thing that we have been talking about at the ready just broadly, even beyond um, kind of the stuff that I was doing with DAOs, which is in the early days of the ready, we co-created everything with our clients almost to a fault. 
Um, so we were very much like, we're not coming with a prescription about like, here's what you need to do. We're going to start where you are. Let's understand your existing tensions, whatever comes up there, that's where the work will actually begin. Um, which I think, you know, is a very theoretically pure way of approaching this work when you're talking about continuous participatory change. I think now we've also been doing this long enough that we see basically the same patterns are always where we start. Uh, so what if we came in with a bit more of a prescription for kind of the early engagement with an organization and then connecting it to to DAOs, one of the projects that I had on my backlog uh, before, you know, I kind of stepped out of this DAO forward role to go do more client work because the ready needed to make money uh, was what would the um, potential kind of like if you if you could fill out an OS canvas with like a good starting point for a new DAO, uh, what would that look like? You know, if I could give you an OS canvas that was partially filled out with some principles and some practices and said, hey, this might get you like 60% of the way there, what would that look like? And would that actually be useful? I think I think it would be, but I we, we have not built that uh, yet. And I have a sense of what would go in some of those fields, but there's gotta be a, not a playbook for running it, but a playbook for starting. That's great, Sam. Great. We actually did that. Let me let me share that with you later. Um, yeah, please do. Look like. <laughs> Thank you. Please do. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, please. Hey, Ryan. Yeah. Hey, Sam. How are you doing? Forward Falcons. Um, <laughs> the um, one thing I, again, I apologize for not being here. Have you done work with organizational network analysis and kind of uh, with DAOs and, and kind of figuring out what the interactions are? Maybe before uh, solidifying or kind of congealing on a on a structure, not in any sort of um, rigorous way. I think there are multiple people at the ready who find um, ONA organization network analysis very interesting, and like we have like poked around with various tools, but we've never really um, made it part of our process. Um, but I think you know there's a lot of curiosity around it. Yeah, yeah. thank you. To chip in there, uh, Together Crew has actually built an organization network analysis tool for DAOs, or at least primarily using Discord, uh, is including Discord, Twitter, Snapshot, etc. as data sources as well. Um, and the tool includes a couple of structural analysis around decentralization and fragmentation, before they were also doing a small world analysis to understand how well the information was flowing and essentially whether the, the social network structure was effective in the DAO for decision making and, and so on. Uh, since it's been a little bit hard, essentially DAOs are still very immature, so looking at very basic problems. So like the market feedback was like, this stuff is amazing, but right now we're still figuring out how we execute payments without them going to the wrong address. Uh, so it was like way more basic concerns many times. Uh, so the way it's evolving now is to use more like that social network to automate different things like automated matchmaking between people, et cetera, like scheduling one-on-ones automatically or otherwise figuring out when people are disengaging, sending them different information. If you're interested in that space, let me know. I can connect you with the chief uh, scientist in that team who's actually an, uh, has a PhD in organization network analysis and is working on this area. But um, anyhow, Bear, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sam. Like super, super interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, my question is, is in regards to, to this idea that you were talking about of the background that most of the times organizations, or in this case, DAOs have, uh, in terms of their history, in terms of how they started, you know, there are like some set of principles, ideas, processes that were set in place. And, and as part of that, you know, at least from my experience, uh, uh, you know, the DAO that I've been contributing to, uh, they've already set an MVV, you know, a mission, a vision, and certain values. But that might not be as clear as people would need them to be, you know, and that, they, that you know, every time... Uh, there's this uh, acknowledgement that they need to be revised and, and rewritten uh, and, and repurposed. But at the end of the day, I feel like what most of DAOs are missing nowadays is this first step of the purpose. You know, I feel like most of DAOs or organizations don't really have a clear purpose on, on what's their, their reason of, of existing. 
And I yeah. think it gets really hard when you already have this historic background of DAOs, how to go back and start from step one, how to go back and like you were saying, this prescription uh, with the purpose, uh, how do you go back and, and are able to to take the, to, to um, ask the community to take the pause and, and take the time to redo yeah. that again? Uh, I don't know if you have any recommendation on, on how to go through that type of process. No, not 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 really. Other than agree that it's hard, that it takes dedicated time, um, and that at the end of the day, what really makes it hard is that if you've done it right, you've probably pissed off some people. Um, because if everybody can, if 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 the like, I guess at least if the purpose has changed at all, if a purpose is so generic that there's no like after we do a change of it, nobody really cares then I don't, I don't know that we've gotten specific enough. Um, so I think there's some real looking in the mirror around, are we willing to do this work knowing that because it is a magnet, we will attract some new folks and inevitably kind of repel some others. And that's hard when you have a history. Um, so yeah, it's a, this is why when we do this work with organizations, it's multi, generally multi-day, multi-step process to like start to get into it because it is so, it can be so hairy. Not a great and helpful answer, I know, but mostly commiseration. No, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael, over to you. And then after this one, we'll have to close. Yeah, of course. I'll keep it quick. Um, Sam, I'm really curious. What are the early signs or sort of red flags in your consulting work that's going to tell you this is not going to work? Like these clients, they, they may be interested, yeah. they're curious, they're excited, but it's not going to go anywhere if you can share anything. That's yeah, great. definitely. Definitely. We, I think, I feel like we've gotten better at this over time. Um, I mean, the biggest one is um, an unwillingness to actually, you know, we would call it do the work. So we often use the metaphor of, you know, we're more like um, trainers than, than anything else. So like, if you think about you're trying to get stronger as an organization, you hire a trainer. If I do all the pushups and you do zero of the pushups, you're not getting any better. And if I give you a great, great presentation about why pushups are great and here's how to do the perfect pushup and you still don't do any pushups, like what are we doing here? So that, you know, looks like not making really any effort to do any of the behavior change that they agree would actually need to happen for things to start to change in, in their organization. And sometimes in our early days, I think we weren't as good at differentiating that because there are plenty of consultants out there um, in consultant companies that are very happy to not make you do anything like they will do they will do it for you they will give you the the, the deck the, the insights and like hand that to you charge you a lot of money and, and go off to the next thing and we're not interested in doing that so that's the main thing and i feel like you can start to get a sense of that just in the contracting process with a client if it's getting kind of obvious that, you know, it's, it's going to be tough to actually get into the work and, and do it together. That's, that's red flag. Number one, that trumps all other red flags. Got it. Much appreciated. Yeah. Um, if there are other questions, I know we have to wrap here. Here's my cool. email address. Well, thank uh, you very much. Very happy to answer questions more there. Fantastic. Sam, thank you very much for joining us. Much appreciated. This was great. Cool. Thank, thank you, for everyone, me. for being here and your participation. Um, it's not working. There we go. Yeah. Hopefully, you join us for the upcoming events. You can do that and hopefully see you all very soon. Have an excellent rest of the day.